Um, morning, everybody. Yeah, the cash box has gone missing. Um, we will be launching an investigation to try and find about 25 quid at some point. Um, uh, wait, is that a I'll... photograph of you looking for it? Yeah, it probably is. Yeah, they're looking very pensive. I didn't pose for that. Um, <laughs> it's great to see so many of you here on such a warm day. Um, and the fact that you've got here on such a warm day, I think, is testament to your passion for what you do. Um, obviously, those people who aren't here are probably less passionate than yourselves because they're playing golf or sitting on Portobello <laughs> Beach right now. Um, but these events are designed to bring the community together. The reason we make them free to attend is that there's no exclusion of anybody from the community. So if you're an IT end user, you work in tech, it's always going to be free. That's our mantra. That will always stay. I'm up here just to give a very quick introduction before the interesting people take over. Um, and I want to start off by thanking the people who make this event possible for you to attend. Um, our sponsors. So we've got Wasabi, BJSS, and Digital, and Cirrus HQ as our co-sponsors. And we've also got a handful of exhibitors for you to go and visit as well. Our sponsors and our exhibitors are very clever people. They like to entice you in with some goodies. Not only is there very good swag on the stands, but a number of them will be raffling prizes, uh, which will be drawn during the drinks reception at the end of the day. Now, there's some amazing stuff on offer here. It's almost like Hamley's up there. Um, Wasabi have got a Liverpool shirt signed by John Barnes. So if anybody's as old as me, you might remember who he is. Uh, and also a Fitbit. Uh, BJSS have got uh, Lego Star Wing X Wing, Star Wars X Wing fighter, Imperial TIE fighter. The Lego geeks out there, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. And, and I know that IT guys love Lego. So do our vendors. Uh, there's a Darth Vader bust. So if you, if you want Darth Vader on view in your house, you can put that together. There's a limited edition pirate ship. That's just BJSS, four loads of Lego being drawn at quarter to four. You've got to be here, by the way. If you do want to win these prizes, you have to be here. We're not going to draw it and go, oh, he's not here, so we'll post it to his office. No, it's brutal. You have to be here. If you're not here, you do not win. We redraw. Uh, Cirrus HQ, Lego Technics, a Ford Mustang Shelby. Corum, a Lego Nano Gauntlet and a Lego Infinity Gauntlet. Now, they are left and right, so there's a pair of Lego gloves to be worn on, on Corum. McNally are doing a competition to win a jam jar speaker. They're raffling a 50-pound whiskey voucher, and they're giving free ice cream all day. So if that's not worth staying for, then nothing is. But obviously, we've got these amazing talks to keep you compelled as well. Um, moving forward, uh, loads of events forthcoming. Uh, we're in Glasgow next for Scott Secure West. We're now doing two Scott Secure events every year. So if you are part of your security or security focused, we'll see you in Glasgow on the 14th of September. If you work in financial services, FinTech Summit, it's 10th year. Can't believe it's been 10 years. I feel so old. That's here, 21st of September. Big full day event. We will be up to the gunnels with that one. And if you, another... Uh, message for our financial services attendees, the Scottish Financial Technology Awards are back on the 12th of October. We will be sending you out details about how you can enter that. So if you are working for financial services, please look out for that email coming through and send it to whoever needs to, to get your entry together or whether it's yourself. But we look forward to, to seeing your entries in for that. That's going to be an amazing time. Digital Transformation October, Expo in November, and then we're into 2024 with the rest. So we look forward to seeing you at those. Um, these events are incredibly interactive, we like to think. Not only do we expect your hands to go up during the Q&A, but if you're one of those people who doesn't really like putting your hand up and being the center of attention, then you can actually, you know, by stealth, put your questions in through Slido, and Mark will deal with that during the Q&A session. All you have to do, and it will come up at the end of the, the speaker session, is scan that QR code. And you can do it from exactly where you're sitting. And then you can just punch your questions through to Mark. And obviously, you can take a bit more time and make your questions a little bit more lengthy if you wish to do so as well, based on what our wonderful speakers are going to be talking about. That's enough from me. Over to the much more interesting people. Have a wonderful day. My staff are here to help you. And thank you to the staff for organizing today. See you soon. Thank you.
Thanks, Ray. Well, as Ray says, we have some cracking speakers lined up today, so we're just going to get straight on with it. Uh, this opening session is going to be looking at maximising the impact of cloud transformation wherever possible. Our first speaker is April Edwards, Senior Developer Advocate and DevOps Practice Lead for GitHub, and she's going to be going through some real-life DevOps examples from both Microsoft and GitHub. So, April, for a start. Good morning. <clears throat> I don't normally sound like I swallowed a duck, so you're gonna have to bear with me today. Uh, good morning. Good morning. I am very excited to be here. Edinburgh is one of my favorite cities, so I'm based in the UK, I'm based down the south. Allergies have been terrible this year, and on my flight up here yesterday, this is what became of my voice, so please bear with me. Um, I work for GitHub, I'm an advocate, and I'm a DevOps practice lead. What does that mean? Um, I've been in the tech industry for over 24 years. I started off in IT ops, moved into development, and I was at Microsoft for about five years, and I worked on the engineering team as a so senior software engineer. And I used all those life lessons from operations and development and really fell into DevOps, so it's been a natural flow for me. So what we're gonna talk about today is DevOps in the real world. How does Microsoft do it? How does GitHub do it? I'm gonna be very clear. We're two separate companies. Even though we are owned by Microsoft, we operate independently, but a lot of the practices I learned in those engineering days, we use at GitHub as well. So they're gonna be translatable, and it's stuff we talk about. So I like to make my sessions interactive. One, it's gonna save my voice today. So how would you define DevOps? You can go ahead and shout it out if you like. Processes. Processes. Who else? Continuous integration. All right, we got two. I'll take two. We all define DevOps in very different ways because we have different life experiences, very different backgrounds. So before we talk about DevOps and get into it, I want to go ahead and play us a little video. So let's grab some popcorn and uh, watch this play. Hmm. But Holland comes in for a pit stop. Time to refuel and change tires. Lou Moore himself changes the tires. Only four crew members, including the driver, are allowed to work on the car. It's a tense time. Holland stays in his seat, anxious to get away. Let's watch. Tires are changed at last. A crewman polishes the windshield as Holland moves away just 67 seconds after he stops. I love this video because this is DevOps. Think about your legacy applications. So back in my day, 24 years ago, if I was deploying an application, I had to walk into my data center, physically plug something into my server and deploy that application. I'd have to make changes to that server, I'd access to the entire data center, whatever I needed to do. Today, most of our developers don't even have access to the infrastructure behind it. They're deploying their apps. So I love this video because this really defines DevOps. In our legacy apps, and you think that, that old video, right? It's slow, it's like watching paint dry, watching them service that car. But they had four people accessing that car, just like our legacy applications. There might be four people in a team. Today, everyone wants to get involved. So when we deploy an application today, we have our development teams, we have our production teams, we have DBAs, quality control, 
project managers, our operational teams, everyone's involved in this whole process that we have today. And we don't have access to a lot of the systems, so we have to go through a gated process to deliver things. So let's talk about the tooling in the first video. The guy is literally using a hammer to bang that tire on that car. Now we're using air wrenches. And if we look at these guys up here, we have a, we have a guy with a jack behind the car. They've got a second guy behind the first guy because they know that is so critical to their process, they have redundancy built in. So we look at how the guys are standing on the side doing nothing. Does anyone know what they're doing over there? Watching, they're monitoring. They're monitoring because they want to make this pit stop even faster. So when we look to develop our applications, we need to think about all the people involved and how we can do it better. So we want to be able to protect ourselves from the instances that hurt. So let's actually define DevOps. And the reason I want to define DevOps is because we're all going to have those different answers. DevOps is going to be the union of process, people, and products to enable continuous delivery of end users. And I want to focus on this word, excuse me, to deliver continuous delivery of value to our end users. And I want to focus on this word value. Because it doesn't matter what tooling we invest, we've all done it. We've bought tooling and spent thousands or millions of pounds on new tools to have a failed process, to have a failed application. So what value are we actually delivering to our customers? Whether you're delivering it internally or you're delivering it to someone externally. And we need to think about the teams. So if you think of an operational team, they're there to keep the lights on 24 by 7. Your development teams are there to push new features. Those two things are not incentivized together and they're delivering a separate value. So we need to learn to align our teams to deliver these things. And I want to talk a little bit about security. Because security isn't just for the security experts, it's for everyone. How many of you took an Uber here today? One person, all right. <laughs> the cost of a breach is more, more cost inefficient in production. So I want to talk about Uber. So we have one person that took an Uber, but we've all heard of Uber, we know what they do. I liked Uber because I could get where I need to go, I knew what I was being charged, they were delivering value to me as a customer. But in 2017, they had a breach. They put a password into their production level code. How many of you have left a password in a place that you shouldn't have? And I'll fix it later. Uber didn't fix it. That breach cost them millions of dollars to get their data back. And then they took your customer data and it was exposed to someone else. So they lost value to you as a customer. Uber had another breach recently. How many of you heard of that? Yep, a couple people. They left another password in their environment, in production. The cost in production is much higher than doing it in development. So we're bringing tools closer to the developers. So when we talk about AI or any of the productivity tools, that's delivering value to our teams and enabling them to do more. Why do these matter? Because if we're monitoring and pulling these stats into our organizations, we know we have better performing teams. We want to monitor things like what's their, what's their time from commit to deploy? How fast are we covering from an incident? Because we're going to have an incident. We're going to have an outage. That's inevitable. What tools are we using this? So when we talk about the tooling side, tooling is 10%. Okay? The, and then really the process is another 10%. So a lot of us have invested in all these tools and it's a messy place, right? So we want to bring them together to deliver that. How do we do that? Now, GitHub, that's where we come in. We want to bring together a developer platform to service you from beginning to end with one single platform. We're not just source control anymore. So how do we do this? Excuse me. Now, GitHub was acquired about five years ago by Microsoft. Um, and when Microsoft decided to make some changes internally, we had a, a new CEO come in, Satya Nadella, you may have heard of him, very famous guy. He brought in a mission to empower every person and every organization on the planet to achieve more. So we changed our ways of working. We ate our own dog food. We used our own tools. At GitHub, I use the GitHub platform every single day. I don't use another platform to deliver my code anymore. It is all GitHub. Now I do integrate it with some other tools like Azure DevOps or third-party security tools. So we had to adopt, in our organizations, a growth mindset. This buy-in came from the top of the organization, our C-levels. We then have a customer-obsessed culture. This meant putting you as the customer first. And then we had to look at aligning to shared objectives, and that's that value, because our teams need to deliver that together. So how did we do this? We changed our definition of done. How many of you remember when you're using consuming a Microsoft product, you had an outage, and you had to call someone in another country? They don't care. 
They, they, they're, they, they, you'll fix your problem, but they don't actually care about what's ap actually happening. So one thing we have to look to do is change our definition of done. We're just not delivering a box software product to you anymore. We're delivering cloud-based products. So we have to set our definition of done as a target before we deploy that to you as the customer. We had to adopt a production first mindset. So remember that chart and the cost analysis of how much it costs to fix something in production? Because you as a consumer do, do not want to see these issues in production environments when and where possible. You don't want your data exposed because you'll lose that value, you lose your customer base, and you lose that trust, and that's huge. Microsoft likes to say we run on trust because they want to enable that. So anytime we write code, we're thinking this isn't going to development environment or test environment, it's going into production. We had to change how we collaborated and how we worked together. Um, and then we had to enhance our security from development to production. Security comes from day one. It comes from our developers. Security starts when your developers clone their code. So how do we enable them? So we leverage DevOps at Microsoft. These are some of the stats that we use for some of our tooling. Now, I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and talk about the Microsoft side instead of the GitHub side. Um, because on GitHub as a platform, GitHub's a smaller company, right? We have about, I wanna say 3,000 employees. Um, we all use GitHub. HR uses GitHub. Our finance teams use GitHub every single day. Now, Microsoft uses a product. How many of you have heard of Azure DevOps, the product? All right, so we're gonna switch gears and talk about this. And the reason why we're gonna talk about this, even though I'm a GitHub employee, I worked on the engineering teams, I worked with the product groups. So I'm gonna give you the real life example of how we delivered this product. So we use it internally. This was us eating our own dog food. And while we're eating our own dog food, I like to say we're drinking our own champagne because it just sounds so much nicer. So we leveraged the product. By using that product, we also found the pain points. As a developer, as an IT pro, as a QA, tester, whatever you do, if you know the pain points in your own product, you can make it better for your consumers. So that's why we leverage it. So how did we get there? How many of you remember Team Foundation Server 2005? I'm sorry. It was bad, bad. Um, Really bad. So Team Foundation Server 2005 actually came out in 2006. It took 18 months to build it, 18, another 18 months to actually ship the product, and it was crap. I, it was terrible. It took us three years to deliver that product. We knew we had to do better. So we started working on our development processes, and we were able to get updates out every three months. But we knew we had to do better. So the journey continued for us, because in DevOps, your journey's never done. It's just a continuation. So we started delivering Team Foundation Server into different, you know, we, we've changed the name. I'm sorry, I'm totally not responsible for the naming. When we then just started deploying Azure DevOps, we then started running our deployments every three weeks. How did we get there? I call it the Goldilocks principle. We start off with a month-long deployment cycle. In our development cycle, we had a month to deploy, and we are finding that's just too long. It was too many gaps between when we were writing our code and deploying it. Um, then we went to the two-week cycle, and actually, that was too tight. So three weeks was our Goldilocks. That was our thing. So if you're consuming a lot of the Microsoft products, every single product team in Microsoft works like this. And in GitHub, we work on through. Each team will have a different development cycle, what works for them. For a lot of the bigger products, you'll see the three-week cycle. To do this, we had to change how our teams worked. We had to eliminate unhelpful KPIs. How many lines of code do you write? Well, it doesn't matter. I might write in 10 lines of code, my colleague might write in 30. We're just different people, different objectives and how we do things. What's our team capacity? What's our burn down rate? What's our, what are our estimates? How do you estimate? We had to remove these things. We had to start delivering quality over quantity. And we had to start measuring outcomes and not outputs. Those outcomes are our value. So how do we track these things? Right, so we're going live to production. If we're thinking with a production first mindset, we're monitoring everything from day one. So we're looking, are you using the feature? Because I'll be honest, you can go buy a product, it can be GitHub, it can be Microsoft. If you're not using it, what value is it delivering to you as a customer? So are your customers using it? Are you using NPS scores? How long does it take your team to deploy things? So I mentioned I was an engineer previously. I was a senior software engineer. And when we deployed stuff, you know, we might have a pipeline that took 50 minutes to run. And an improvement we were measured against was maybe getting that 50 minute pipeline down to 15 minutes or 10 minutes so we could do our deployments more quickly. Those are really helpful metrics for our teams. And live site health. So if you ever work with um, any cloud product, GitHub or Microsoft, we've had some outages. I'm sorry, not my control. But we notify you as a customer. You can go to the site. You can see the live site health. You can also give feedback. 
So that feedback helps us deliver that live site health better. But we're transparent when we're having an outage because nobody's perfect. We had to evolve our people. So we've, we have our tooling, we have our processes, each are about 10% of the DevOps cycle. But people are 80% of, of the DevOps lifestyle. So our teams previously were divided into program management and you know, we had engineering and all our different teams spaced out and they were all siloed. So how do we break down those barriers? We had to align our teams. We took our teams and we built feature teams. So we would have a PM, we would have a developer tech lead, or excuse me, a tech lead, and then we'd have engineers. So I told you I was a senior software engineer. That doesn't tell you what I do at all. How did that happen? Well, think about our application stacks. If I'm a data developer, and I'm not, I'm sorry if anyone is, data is not my thing. I hate working with data, personally. It's just like, I just don't love it. Like, I, I get it, but I just don't, I don't want to be a specialist. It doesn't, you know, I care more about the APIs and the UX. So that means I have no empathy for what's happening in the data stack. If I'm making a change to the UI, what's it doing to our data? How does it impact it? So we became more vertical engineers, and they changed all of our titles to software engineers. So I had to start taking on tasks that were outside of my comfort zone, security. I had to take on some data tasks, all sorts of things. I had to learn new coding languages, so I had empathy for the other people in my team. So our feature teams were made up of different types of engineers. So for example, when I first joined engineering, I was on a cloud native team, and we were global, mostly based across EMEA, but we had four different time zones to contend with, and that was really, really hard. That was really hard. Time zones are tough. Um, I then was moved into a UK-based team so that geographically we were all really close together. And I had a data person on my team, thankfully. Um, I had um, an AI person on my team. I had a C-sharp person on my team. We had all different experiences and we all came together and learned from each other. So I might pick up a task that was outside of my comfort zone, but it gave me the things that I needed to learn and be a better engineer. So we had to evolve our full stack team. So, when we did this, we moved people into the same room. A little impossible with COVID, so things changed. So we had virtual teams. So we still very much have a hybrid working mindset. I'm completely remote. I do have an office. I don't see it. I don't care to see it because I like working in my pajamas. But that is supported. But each team has 10 to 12 engineers, and you'd pick a feature to work on. So if I was on the Azure DevOps team, I would pick that feature to work on. And you'd be set in that team for about 10 to 12 months. Um, you have that engineering lead, that product owner that oversaw what was happening in those teams. And you had clear goals. So each team had a clear charter and OKRs. So again, the buy-in from Satya was production first mindset and all those things I listed out. But each team had their own AKRs, OKRs, excuse me, and their own team charter. And the team charter is important because each team needed its own culture. So if I was working on a feature team and said, you know what, I want to go learn something else, I want to go do something else the next year or the next cycle, I could. I could go work on something that interests me. But I had that ability to do that. But the most important thing is to create empathy of our engineers to you as a consumer, we have to own the product from inception to production. We own it all in that full cycle, the full DevOps life cycle from the planning, development, deployment, and monitoring. So we had to understand everything. But that impacts you as a customer. That's how we have the live site health. The other great thing Microsoft has done, and GitHub, we've open sourced so many of our products. You can go to github.com, you can see the products, you can open up an issue, and you can give feedback directly to those product groups. I used to be one of those people that would see your feedback. Now, the more feedback you give, the higher we prioritize a lot of those features, and that's how we prioritized our features in our products. But I would own that feature from the moment you opened up that issue, to the time we put into production. I'd be that owner for that, for that feature bit. So that was really important. And giving those teams a culture and the ability to grow and learn is really, really important. We want to enable our teams to fail fast and to learn. It's a learning experience when things don't always work this way. We had to measure the things that mattered in these teams. Are our people happy? And you know, happy is such a relative thing, but are you being happy and productive at work? And what's their well-being like? You know, do people have families? Do they want to take, make sure everyone's taking a holiday? Um, are they doing the right things? What's their performance like? So a lot of times I was measured, if I was taking on a new task, I was learning a new thing. Um, I was handed a really large C-sharp issue in a project, and I'm not a hardcore C-sharp developer. I learned it, I understood it, worked through it, and if that task maybe took me 10 hours, I learned something, and then the next sprint cycle, 
I take on a similar task in that remit, and it might get down to five hours. So I was always improving my learning, and that was hard. And it's hard, because you know, you're working in a team, you're trying to get out a feature, and going, oh, I have to learn all these things. I feel like I'm the one slowing everyone down. But then someone else was taking on a task they were less comfortable with, and that's how we became vertical, develop vertical engineers. How efficient are we? How well is the team communicating? Again, that globally diverse team I was on, all of us were living in different countries. Dubai, Italy, Amsterdam, Germany, France, and I was in the UK. And all of us were living in separate countries in which we grew up from. So I have the culture in which I was born and raised in and embedded into my brain, and then I have the culture I live in now. So each member of that team was bringing in two to three different cultures. So those things about how we collaborate, how we communicated, that improved over our project life cycles. And what we found in those six month delivery cycles with a lot of our customers is that we improved and that was learnings and that was improvement and we were incentivized on that value we were delivering to you as the customer. So I think the reality is remote work is going to continue. It's not going away. We have remote work, we have hybrid work, it gives people flexibility. So how do we empower people to do more with this? How do we allow them to do this, help this? Um, but working remotely is hard. Previous to joining GitHub, my manager was in Australia and that meant a 6 a.m. call with her. Then I have my folks in the U.S. that meant a 6 p.m. call. How do I do that? I would divide my days into twos or only work early one day and work late another. But a really good thing to do, we have an open office hour in my team as well. So today I have an hour open, off, uh, excuse me, an hour open office hour. Um, we call it like Coffee Beats or something, uh, some creative name. We literally open up a Teams or Zoom call and we all just work for an hour. You don't have to talk, you can chat. Just, you have people, because we're all in different places. It's great to have that camaraderie. We also run like brown bag learning. So everyone brings a lunch, or let people expense a lunch. And then come to that, and we share our learnings. So for instance, I had a junior engineer on one of my teams. She just learned Git, and she's like, oh, I don't know, I don't really want to talk about it, I don't want to feel dumb. I'm like, no, I want to know how you learn Git, because you're going to teach me something. And we all learned something from that junior engineer because she learned it in a different way than I learned it. And she found out some really cool stuff we were able to kind of bring to the team. And that brought value. So taking the time out for your team members in a remote world is really, really critical. So let's build from here. Um, you know, we always talk about there's 100 million developers using GitHub today um, and all this great stuff. So we've integrated all these tools. I'm not going to go through them today, um, but a lot of them are there on the GitHub platform to talk about collaboration, inner sourcing. Um, how we do automation and development, and then how we build in security from day one. That is crucial that security is coming to the platform. If any of you watched Microsoft Build, um, a lot of the GitHub features are coming to a lot of the Microsoft products, Copilot, uh, GitHub Advanced Security. We're integrating those two platforms together really well. So you have your choice in tooling, and it can integrate that into the cloud. So I will be around later, as I'm, my voice is actually going to go now. Um, I want to leave you all with some resources. So anything that we start putting forward that's new into the infrastructure, uh, out into the ether, githubnext.com. That's what's the latest, greatest, that's what's coming down the pipeline. We always put our stuff, uh, any new things coming out on the github.blog site. Uh, you'll see features, new products, insights, customer sto stories, all sorts of great stuff. But the greatest thing is we put our, all of our roadmaps are public at GitHub, same at Microsoft, so you can see what's coming. Now remember I told you about these feature teams. So while it's on the public roadmap, if another priority comes in, like let's say we have an outage, which we might have had recently, um, we had to prioritize some fixes, which meant some things on the roadmap got pushed, but to prioritize reliability for you as a consumer. Um, and then, uh, yeah, my personal blog, nothing important. But I want to thank you all for putting up with my uh, little duck voice today. Uh, I think we're welcoming up, uh, is it back to you, Mark? Yes, it it's is. Off to Mark. Yes. Thank you very much, April. Very well done for holding it together for that period. You know, you, can we go get some Lego now? Yeah, we can go and get some Lego now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you spend your entire life training your voice. It's a deeply personal thing. So when it escapes and goes back to the wild, um, it's just, you know. If anyone asks, I used interpretive dance. <laughs> Damn it, I was looking forward to that yes. bit. Anyway, um, I, I know I mentioned the air conditioning earlier. Is anybody too cold? Yes. Could we possibly switch off the aircon just for a wee while? People will start to complain about the heat shortly. We can switch it back on again, and we'll just seesaw backwards and forwards for the rest of the day. It'll be fine. 
Um, there was something I think. Oh, yes, if you've got any questions uh, for April, there'll be an opportunity to ask those questions later when we put the questions to the three panellists. I like difficult questions as well, please. Excellent. Uh, Alison McIntyre is the UK Ambassador for the FinOps Foundation. Um, Alison's going to be talking about why it's needed with a particular focus on forecasting. So, Alison, over to you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. So, I finished my last job two weeks ago. I start my new job on Monday. But I am, until tomorrow, still a fan, an ambassador for the FinOps Foundation. So I was able to have a title um, when we were walking downstairs. And my, well, my husband said to me before I left this morning, he said, so what are you going to do? Are you going to stand up there and say, hi, I'm Alison, and I'm kind of not working right now? I said, well, yeah, but maybe a bit slicker than that. <laughs> and when I was walking downstairs and I was um, saying this, the phrase, you're just a, what was it, a minister without... Portfolio. Portfolio. See, I can't even I can't even wing that that far. But yeah, my name's Alison McIntyre. I've worked in IT my whole life, mostly financial organisations. I started my FinOps journey end of twenty ish. I was sort of doing things that were moving in that direction, but I hadn't heard of it. I became a FinOps lead for um, a large financial institution. I'm pretty sure if you're on LinkedIn, you'll be able to find out very quickly, but obviously I no longer work for them, so I'm not up here speaking on their behalf. Um, as part of moving into that role, I came across the FinOps Foundation. They're a large organization now, and they provide guidance. They provide the kind of blueprint for what FinOps is all about. I got involved. I am one of those people that likes to learn from other folk. I always believe that there is always lots of cleverer people in this room, and I'm very, very sure that most people here will eclipse me in that regard. But I also like to give back, and that's part of the ethos of the FinOps Foundation, is that it's by the people for the people. It's all a bit, some might say, happy clappy, but I wanted to do my bit, so I got involved in a working group, happened to be the forecasting working group. I'm now currently involved in the commitment-based um, discussion working group, and we're creating white papers. And that led and snowballed, and I talked a bit, and I got involved, and then I was asked to become an ambassador, which is really great, because you get opportunities like this. So I live up just north from here, in, near Kenross, with my husband and my two dogs. Always got to put a photo of the dogs. Makes it more personal. So let's get on to the meat of it. So we're all here at this. It's about cloud. So I'm not gonna, not gonna go into that in too much detail, but it has changed things. April was talking about going into a data center. Oh my God, <laughs> the thought even gives me the willies. But I was an infrastructure delivery manager. I used to do that delivery of it. And my business areas that I delivered for would say, oh, yeah, well, you need this many servers, Alison. How long is that going to take? And I'll be like, Psh, you know, maybe. And they're still virtual. I mean, I'm not going back to Tintin. Oh, you know, maybe nine months. They go, oh, God, well, we need five of them. You better, you better get us eight. Because, you know, by the time we need more, we don't have that lead time. All of those things. Cloud's magic. It's awesome. But the money. How many headlines have you seen? Uncontrolled spend all of those things. Ah, we're starting to think about FinOps. So a quick, you know, shake you down. How many of you know what FinOps is first off? Excellent. How many of you are practicing FinOps in your organizations? Okay, good. Lots of you not though. So for those that are already doing it, I'm sorry if this is a right bore, but you never know, there might be a nugget to take away. So there's a lot of financial implications of using the public cloud, right? Loads of them. I'm not going to go into all of them, but some at my last organization that were kind of key to us, bit of bill shock. We were still early in our journey, so it wasn't like the headline level bill shock, but it was still there, small programs got up and running maybe with some credits from the very friendly cloud providers that signed us up to big deals. Here's your credits. Programs thought that's great. We won't have a bill.
because it'll all be covered by the credits and then three quarters of the way or two thirds of the way through the program, the credits ran dry. Oh, that was a shock when they actually had to start paying and it wasn't the tokens paying for it. I talked about those commitments. For us, it was, we had a big commitment. We had no line of sight to whether we were gonna meet that commitment, and those targets. Yeah, in the first year, it's all good because it's gonna ramp up. Everybody says it's so quick. I worked for an organization that was quite slow. It was heavily regulated and it's difficult to do change. Um, I know there's those of you here who work in much more agile environments, but lots of us don't. Lots of us just don't. We know, we know it's hard to deliver anything, you know. And we do do the agile, we do do the DevOps and everything, but it's still hard. So I hope that some of these maybe speak to you or you'd nod your head and go, oh yeah, we have that there. And hopefully not all of them, but maybe. So then you get into sort of thin ops. What is it for those of you that didn't put your hand up? It is evolving, it has grown. Um, I should have put this, the graph in. FinOps Foundation has this graph of the, the number of Google searches of, or just on FinOps and it's like it's chunking up and then in the last year it's just gone stratospheric. People are getting scared, they, they've, especially where they've lifted and shifted to the cloud and everybody said it would cost less, and gosh, it doesn't. That coupled with COVID, coupled with the economic world we find ourselves in, means our businesses are needing to ostensibly spend less. But FinOps is about spending wisely, getting value. April mentioned bringing value. They're, all, they're, they're also interlinked. You'll see in the box that you know, FinOps isn't financial management. I am not, I am, never will be an accountant. I'm an infrastructure girl. But I love the, that it, I love numbers as well. I'm not a techie techie, but I can kind of do that speak between the absolute really clever techies and the business that are wanting value. I've always been in their roles that are sort of that translator. And FinOps has worked for that. I, I sort of fell into it, I made a, a, a leap into it, I guess, a, a controlled falling into it. Um, but it's definitely about bringing value. A lot of FinOps presentations are always about optimizing. Yeah, save some money. I'm not gonna talk about that today, because I like to talk about the other stuff. Everybody knows FinOps is about optimizing. Using less, usage optimization, can't help myself, or paying less for it, rate optimization. Don't optimize, just quick thing, don't optimize your rate and pay less for it and make commitments until you've optimized your usage, because it's still waste. Don't go around going, oh, we've saved because we've got a reservation on it. If you're not using all of it, turn it off. Use less. But because everything is measured in seconds used or whatever, it's so granular. Instead of, oh, I got a VM in a data center and, and I paid for it back then and it's maybe been taken off at the top level. You know, you'd, business areas, I get asked a lot, or I did in my old job, get asked a lot to be able to help them with their business case of moving to cloud. And you go, all right, well, do you know how much your your application or your service or your product costs now and they look at you like, no. Or even worse, they go, oh yeah, it's only 20 pounds, <laughs> making it up. And I'm like, yeah, well, what about all the kit that's running on? Oh, that's already paid for. And I'm like, yeah, well, you're gonna have to replace it at some point, you're gonna have to upgrade it. We had a, a major um, currency challenge, a lot of big organizations do. You know, I think we finally got off Windows 2008, but now we're chapping on the door of 2012. That comes with massive costs. All of that is the cost of your product as it was or your service. So I am going to go into one element of FinOps. It's about forecasting. I was doing a huge piece of work last year. We needed forecast. We had these quite, we thought, quite large um, commitments with cloud providers. We needed to know how we were tracking to them. Um, spoiler alert we knew we weren't going to meet one. We slowed down, we'd had a pivot, we'd got a new CEO, we, we'd had so much change, we just faced into it. And our, our 
cloud provider that we were partnered with knew that, but we needed to, you can't just say, oh, I'm not going to meet my target, because they're going to say, well, what are you going to meet? So this became forecasting. Why do we need forecasts? I've put a few up here. But understand why you might need them. Do any of you are aware, do you do forecasting of your cloud spend? Do you know if it happens at your organization? Do you think it's good? It's hard. It's really hard. But what I will say is, it doesn't have to be perfect. I speak to so many of my, what were my interns, sorry, I'm still in that hybrid of, it's still my job, it's not my job anymore, past tense, so I'll mix in and out of it. But I'd say to the new, new business areas on boarding, and I'd say, oh, I'd like a forecast, please, before you onboard onto the cloud, and they go, oh, I thought you were going to tell me the forecast. Well, I, I don't know what you're developing. <laughs> I don't know how you're developing it, but your developers do. And I would get the admin person, or I get the PM, or I get that. They'd say, how will I know? And I said, go and speak to your engineers. So those of you who are engineers in the room, I'm speaking to you with DevOps, SecOps, Sec DevOps. You've got to be thinking how much it costs because that makes it better. That gets your value. Because once you know what it costs, people say, oh, FinOps is all about cutting costs. It's not about cutting costs. If your cloud costs double, but your, I always use the term widget, whatever matters to you, whether it's sales, throughput, accounts opened, whatever your widget is that you measure, if that's quadrupled, your cost's doubling, happy days. Just know what works for you. But if you've no idea what you're planning on spending or what you roughly think it looks like, how are you ever in control? How are you developing things that are right? That's me with my FinOps preaching a bit. Hopefully some of these do make sense. Everyone always thought oh, they'd give me a forecast and they say, and then be shocked when I came back next month and said, can you just refresh your forecast? Oh, I've given you a forecast. It's not budgetary. It's about what you're using, how you're using it, because it feeds so many different elements. And just that, um, what do they call it, the Prius effect. You know, if you look at something when Prius is on, you know, we maybe need a, a newer version of that. But when they first came out, people changed the way they drove. And even before Prius, do you remember that? I used to get a hire car or something, and it would do the whole red-green thing of how, well, no, how efficiently you were driving, and you suddenly go, oh, I'll ease off a bit. It's instant feedback. That's cloud. You get your, it's not quite instant, but almost real time. That allows you to make value decisions. So before I dive into how, we, how I approached forecasting, I'm just going to do a quick bit on metadata. Everybody always talks about tags and labels. Oh, they're brilliant, magic. Tag everything, you'll be nailed. I joined the team, I harvested all the tags, and yes, we had cost center, and yes, we had what we call application ID, and oh, what a surprise, 0000. zero, zero, zero. AL is our prefix for our application. AL12345, uh, you know, rubbish. It's early in the morning, I'll try not to swear. Um, also, not everything can be tagged, right? It's really good theoretically. I didn't use tagging at all. And I had 99.5% of our costs were always charged back. And I had an owner for them. I had forecasts for all of them. I'm not saying the forecasts were always good, but I had them. So I harvested the data. Initially, I literally went through all sorts of things, whether there were tags in it, and they were good tags, I would harvest that data, whether we had onboarding records for who they were, whether there was something in the naming convention, I pulled all those different elements together and started building up what was, you know, had a very highfalutin title of our mapping table. And our mapping table had the um, account, subscription, project ID and name, and then it had the I had three layers of hierarchy for my organization. This is organization hierarchy. Instead of it being some gobbledygook name, suddenly it's starting to mean something. I felt three layers was about right. I would have what you might term division, business unit, that type of big chunk. And then you, the second level would be about 
a team or a department, whatever works for you. And then the third level generally for us was like a workload application type thing. In time, I wanted to link it up with our CMDB. And if everything was tagged or we would link it and we would say, give me the application ID or the service ID, translate this into the language that makes sense to you. If you've got a decent CMDB, you can then harvest all this information. I couldn't, I had to build it first, but that, that would be the, the goal. Because why have this data everywhere else? That's rubbish. Have it one place that's control, keep it up to date. But it doesn't necessarily have to be tags. You can build it outside. These are still tags though. These are just synthetic tags. They're, they're external to the cloud provider. So we did it right at the account level. And that's what, that's what led on to our forecasting. So our approach to forecasting because we map everything at the project and the subscription level, we did forecasting at that level. Oh, holy crap, that's us asking everybody to, to go for every single subscription project or account to give us a, they didn't like it. They wanna say, Alison, I think it's gonna be 10 grand next month for application X. Or they might say to me, it'll be four grand in dev, two grand in pre and whatever in prod. I can't do the sums this morning. Um, I would take that. <laughs> to be brutal, I'd take anything that they would give me. Go easy, these people are busy, they are engineers, but, but it's all part of the cultural shift as well, speaking to them, not you must do it. And I have people saying, I have no idea. There are times I have turned around and said, I don't think you're ready to be operating on the cloud if you have no idea. That was probably as firm a stance as I took. But I'd have others that I'd go, Okay, so do you think it's going to be 10 grand next month? Like, oh, God, no. So what, a grand? Oh, no, probably about 500 quid. Like, All right, well, we're not going to sweat over 500 quid. Will it get to 10 grand? Oh, it might, or oh, five grand. Okay, you. But, you know, I just throw out crazy numbers to get them to go. They do have an idea. They just get a bit freaked out. Um, I started with existing workloads. Obviously, good place to start, right? But because we were at the beginning of our journey, existing did not really give me any view. It was a small, small amount of where we would be in three years' time. Hark back to our big commitment was the first anniversary was in three years' time. I needed a view, so I needed a view of all the, the pipeline workloads. Um, things to think about where an owner didn't, because, you know, not everybody's a good citizen, right? And I'd like to, if I was being fair to them, I'd say I deal with really busy people who have bigger priorities. I'd also say, how dare they not give focus to FinOps? But I also appreciate my place in the pecking order. So where they didn't, I didn't leave blank lines. I would take last month's actuals and I would flatline it. And people would say, well, why don't you know it's going to go up, Alison? Why don't you do that? As soon as you start doing too much for them, they're not going to be thinking about their spend. There's got to be a balance between. But you know your organizations, you know your individuals, but just some things to consider. We then got to the stage I was talking about pipelines. We asked people to put placeholders into pipelines. I think that's going to be a continuous battle. But as you engage more, once they've done the sort of basic stuff, the foundation stuff, you can start having conversations with them. Where are they going? engage with them a lot more. You then get into a cycle of actually showing them the data back, because that's cloud, everything's there for you to see in near real time. How are you trucking against, how is your spend trucking against your forecast? They start caring more and they go, why am I so far over my forecast? Well, you're either overspending or your forecast was pants. Let me help you get your forecast better. Let's, let's drill into it. I, I'm not an engineer but I can apply common sense and I can help you and I can sort of get in the, get in the guts of what you're spending the money on. And we found, folks say, oh, no, no, these numbers are completely wrong because we don't, we're not using Spanner. Right. You are using Spanner. I've got Spanner costs in your project. Oh, it turns out somebody was just checking something out in Spanner and hadn't turned it off. It wasn't big spend. But even those little things of working with them, they went, oh, okay, I want to pay a bit more attention to it. Um, so I mentioned that they didn't really like to break it down to account. Excuse me a sec. So we let them, we let them put sort of bucket ones in. 
hated those damn bucket ones because then they were never allocated. The benefit of doing it down at the account level is you can make sure you've got something for every account or project subscription. When they're bucketed at some name that they use, how do you know what that marries back to? It's really nebulous. So chipped away, chipped away. Um, just keep improving it. Don't sweat it. Again, anything is better than nothing. Just get people thinking about it. Think yourselves, if you're engineers, think about it. Think about, I thought it was going to be this much, and it's ended up being this much or, or this less. Is that good? Is that bad? Is that worth it? Because, you know, we're talking about value. Why are you doing this to deliver value? You want to do it for the best value. My view is that I was there to help them be successful. I'm measured on how well the forecasts are and how close they are to reality. It's kind of hard. They're not my forecasts. I'm just like kind of the orchestrator of them. But, but their success was my success. One of the biggest things we had right at the beginning was getting that agreement that my forecast numbers that got rolled up, because that was the thing with the three-layer hierarchy, I can then roll them up to business unit, to application or anything, even though they come in at that micro level, um, was the sole source of cloud forecasts. When I first did it, they'd come and ask for mine, and then they would, God alone knows where they got the others, and then they'd say, well, Alison, someone over here said we were going to spend 11 million must have to be careful not to use any real numbers. Um, why is yours different? I'm like, I don't know. I don't know how they've done theirs. So we got to that stage that this was the, the single sole source of the truth. And it was appreciated that it wasn't perfect, but it was the best. And therefore, we keep iterating the one to get the one better. Yeah, we iterated it. We iterated it a lot. The first forecast I pulled together, I was like, that's awesome. That looks really good. And then three months later, someone said, oh, can we have that refreshed? And I went, oh, gosh, no, I don't know if we can. I'm going to have to go and do it all again from scratch. So then I did that probably a couple of times in a couple of different ways and um, then went, this isn't working. I need something that can be cyclical. And we do it monthly. We went out. We asked them to forecast for a year um, about this time of year. We then extend that to the end of next year. So at any point in time, the maximum time they're forecasting for is 18 months. The reason we do it at this time of year is because then you do get into budgetary cycles. If we had an uplift on every pound that our engineers spent, we put an uplift on it, and that went to our shared costs. So things like Splunk, the support contracts, Dynatrace, GitHub, all of those sort of tools that were central that everybody's using we would pay in the, the CCOE, we paid that bill, but it was a fundamental cost of operating in our cloud. We needed to balance our books, because how much were we going to get back in through our uplift versus how much were we going to have to pay on our bills, all of those things. So that's how we did it cyclically. Um, and yeah, every month we went out and said, refresh it. We gave them their actuals, though. Don't give somebody a blank sheet of paper. I don't know how you lot are, but I'm like oh, overwhelmed by it. Where to start? Give me some reality. If you've not got any reality, speak to colleagues, peers, other people who are already doing it. I've probably covered some of these. Level of, level of granularity. We did go to the lowest level. Whew. It's a lot of extra work. But it does mean you can see that you've covered everything. <coughs> Sorry, Excuse me. Me. Yeah, I've got to speed up. I'm too chatty. Um, things to consider. You're going to get these slides. Know who owns it, because if you don't know that, know your why. Why do you need forecasts? If you don't know that, why are you doing it? It's a lot of effort. But anything is better than nothing. Um, lessons learned. You're going you're gonna to do it wrong first. Just learn, move on, don't sweat it. Don't overwrite your historic data. Remember forecasts for August that you made in January. You then have a forecast for August that you might have made in February and March and April and May. You need to know how that changes. Don't only ever have one forecast for, eight, for August. We failed there. And then I had no idea how volatile the forecasting was. 
Um, if you're hard mapping to business areas or to applications and they change, don't. Have a way to look them up and remap them on your magic mapping table so that they're always alive and you can see the trends. Get it running and run it and invest in the manual before you automate because you will change it. And just work out what works for you. Um, I'm going to very speedily say we then used our forecasting for anomaly detection. Everybody was scared about overspend. Everyone was scared about bill shock. We plumbed those forecasts directly into budgets in the CSPs. We then set alerts on those budgets. So you have said you're going to spend that much. I'll make that your budget. We'll then have an alert at 50%, 75%, 90%. If the alert for 50% spend is triggered in week one, I care about it. If it's triggered in week three of the month, I don't give a damn about it. You're doing good. Sift out all the noise, because those alerts are theoretically really great. They're absolutely abhorrent with overwhelming you with noise that isn't important. But that's when I got more traction back into the engineering community because I was supporting them from overspend, but they had to give good forecasts. So then you get to the cycle, it's not just budgetary. And just find ways, hooks, to make it real to whatever your organization is. Um, I just put this last one up. The FinOps Foundation does a survey every year, and these are some of the challenges that people, they don't add up to 100% because people get to multi-pick. So you can see that forecasting has gone down a bit, but it's still at 24% of people who responded still had a problem with it. I think the next biggies are containers and getting cost allocation for containers. Um, where I did work, we were all about super big containers and shed. shit. It's really difficult to allocate it out. You've got to have a strategy from the beginning. Hopefully that's piqued some of your interest. For those of you who don't know anything about FinOps, sorry I ran slow and then had to run really fast. I should have been watching my clock a bit better. But um, I will be around until sort of post lunchtime, so please come and have a chat. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alison. Um, our third speaker in this session is Shona O'Flaherty, um, co founder of Sushi Cloud. Basically, what Shona wants to talk about is how to scale machine learning within the current state of cloud infrastructure. So, over to you. Hi there. Um, thank you for the introduction, Mark. Uh, my name is Shauna. I'm coming to you from Toronto, Canada. Um, so, yeah, I'm here today to talk to you about um, AI machine learning and how it interacts with the current state of infrastructure and architecture in the cloud. I am co-founder and COO of a cloud computing company. We do bare metal CPU and GPU, specifically targeted at um, R&D, academia, and startups. Um, I'm also an entrepreneur in residence at MIT, um, so I'll give a little bit more of an academic lens today. Um, so my story, why am I relevant and why am I here talking to you today? Um, I started at PwC in the Oracle Cloud um, HCM group, doing large-scale implementations for the large pension funds, the banks. Um, I lasted about five years. Large enterprise was not for me. I then went to DESA. We were a fintech building um, maintenance algorithms looking at fraud detection for the banks. We ended up doing a really cool exit to Square. Um, and then I founded my own company named Neural. Um, we were doing predictive maintenance algorithms for the heavy freight rail industry. This is where I became very um, familiar with the large cloud providers, having to um, do a lot of OPEX, um, project planning, DevOps. We were fundraising on the back of our cloud spend. Um, so after that experience and understanding what it actually meant to use the cloud and not use on-prem technology, um, I sold to one of the large engineering firms and I started Sushi Cloud with my co-founder, Aaron. Um, so on average, you know, a model can have anywhere between 100,000 parameters up to billions of parameters. Um, a lot of people like to look at large language models that, such as ChatGPT, since it's so popular right now, but in practice, um, natural language processing, a lot of different types of ML models require such heavy amounts of compute. Um, 
And what does that mean? So that means you have to make some pretty significant decisions whether or not you're going to be, you know, doing your pilot and doing your training and retraining in the cloud or on-prem. So both have, you know, pros and cons. Um, so let's walk through them. The current cloud providers, you know, force locked-in tools, um, different containers that perhaps are no longer relevant to what it is you're looking to do. Um, there's a lot of admin permissions that you have to go through. Um, this is one of my favorite things to talk about is data egress and ingress fees. I think it's pretty insane to have to pay such astronomical amounts to move your own data. I bring this up because it's such a critical piece when you are establishing your cloud infrastructure plan. Um, you need to understand that when you're moving to the cloud from on-prem and you're doing, you're using hot storage, it's a critical piece of the puzzle to understand how you move your data, where you move your data, who's calling it, how many calls you have, and what that means for the life cycle of the models that you're looking to put into production. Um, it's excellent for dispersed teams, of course. Um, especially during COVID, we saw such an uptick in cloud utilization for DevOps teams. Um, and then on-prem. So we constantly get asked about on-prem, why the cloud is a better option. Um, so some of the you know, downfalls of on-prem are legacy hardware. NVIDIA pushes out brand new stuff every single year. You're going to have a massive bill to be able to keep up with you know, putting new infrastructure in place every single year, depending on what it is you need to access. Um, we constantly get, uh, we, we service a lot of the academic institutions in long queues and long lines is probably one of the biggest things that we um, work through with them. If everyone's accessing the same cluster at the same time, you will have very degraded opportunity to use the resource. Um, it's easier to control costs and spend, um, and latency is a huge um, you know, upside of on-prem infrastructure. Um, I say it's easier to control costs and spend because the access and the way the nodes and the cores are being utilized is just much easier and not having to have cloud telemetry to track exactly what it is you're doing. Um, so training and scaling. So budgeting for the unknown. This is one of the biggest things that um, is plaguing startups, academic institutions, and I, it's amazing that Allison just went through, um, you know, FinOps. It really is a black hole. It's almost impossible to really understand what your training time, how many hours, the amount of people that we sit down with, you know, it's impossible to know, especially if you have millions of parameters, you don't know how many hours will take to train, retrain, especially if you want to productionize, move off of a GPU or a CPU onto a GPU, your cost is going to be all over the board. Um, so the days of having by the second, by the minute, even by the hour cost is simply not going to scale with the future needs of what machine learning requires. Um, so, and then to come to project planning as well, it's near impossible. So say your institution wants to put 10 models into production that year. The statistics are not in your favor. Over 80% of models do not make it into production. In order to go into production, that's how you commercialize and that's how you make money. So if you look at the statistics of project planning and you want to productionize 10, you have to work backwards. In order to work backwards, you have to know your hours, you need to know your resource allocation, you need to know your personnel allocation, and you need to really understand what that project pipeline is going to look like, which again is very impractical when you're looking at a per hour usage. Um, I'll tell you a quick story um, that's relevant here. Um, when we sat down with Carnegie Mellon University, one of their labs was telling me about you know, utilizing their on-prem infrastructure. And as a backup, they of course go to the public cloud providers. Now, um, one of their lovely PhDs had left on a Thursday. It was a long weekend. And unfortunately, he forgot to turn his instance off. And he came back on the following Tuesday. And they had a $25,000 bill. Um, this happens more often than I can tell you. Um, it's the unfortunate reality. 
a lot of people who access the cloud don't have fancy telemetry systems that are tracking their usage, their hours. There's not a lot of fail safes in order to turn it off. Um, and once the machine has been consumed, there's no way around it. Um, so now I want to talk to you a bit about bare metal virtual um, versus virtual machines. Um, bare metal is not new. Now the interaction with bare metal in the cloud is new. The public cloud providers don't provide by the hour cloud consumption on bare metal. Um, one of the extreme benefits of bare metal is it's bring your own tools. So there are pre-configured containers, but there's no forced containerization and there's no forced tools. So say you have a particular type of orchestration layer or methodology you enjoy using, you get a direct SSH access token to the machine. It's single tenant, it's never shared, and you're able to control your environment and create your own sandbox. Um, this is extremely beneficial to R&D. Um, a lot of our motivation at Sushi is on the R&D side. Um, in order to control your spend, understand what your ROI is going to be in productionize, you have to spend so much time in R&D. And again, the by the hour consumption, shared machines, degraded performance significantly impacts that. The latency and the scores for bare metal are significantly improved over virtual machines. What would maybe traditionally take 100 hours to train can take downwards of 10 hours, 15 hours. So again, you see cost reduction because of the amount of time accessing the resource. Um, virtual machines are not friendly for R&D and training and retraining purposes. Um, when you use a portion of a core or a portion of a thread and it's multi-tenant, it means you're sharing with your neighbors. There is significant downsides to that with noisy neighbors and security protocol issues. Now, corporate versus startup. I know I keep talking about the labs and R&D, but large enterprise also is experiencing the same issues with cost, performance, um, and you know, having to use force tools that the public cloud providers um, provide them with. I mention that because a lot of the time we hear when people are hiring, they're looking for very specific types of engineers that have worked in very specific types of sandboxes. This becomes problematic as you look to scale and you look to productionize, and it's not a very sustainable long-term way of doing ML in the cloud. Um, and I want to finish with leaving you with the idea of coming back to that day one, how it looks so dramatically different from day 100. Um, we recently did a, a large partnership that we announced with Wasabi to do a full storage integration. There's so many interesting alternatives on the market right now that offer flat and fixed fees. Um, the benefit of this really significantly impacts your OpEx, your ML Ops, your DevOps, your FinOps, all of your abilities to project plan, move models into training, have no force tools, have no force sandboxes, and be able to actually productionize in a way that's scalable for the future. Um, the reality is machine learning and AI is becoming so sophisticated, you shouldn't have to pick between on-prem and deal with the capital that it takes to run on-prem or choose a cloud provider that simply doesn't fit your needs for the long term um, as AI becomes much more complex um, and complicated. So, yeah. That's good. Thank you very much. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Right. Just to remind you of what Ray was talking about earlier, um, we can do it old school, you can stick your hand up, we've got a couple of live microphones in the hall and we'll get a microphone to you. Um, if I identify you as the questioner, uh, could you begin by telling us who you are and where you're from, okay? You can also do it via Slido, and Slido's up there at the moment. If you haven't already done so, um, it's either on the screen there or it should be on your badge as well. Could you please share the slides with the delegates at the end? Yes, Pete, I can. Uh, right, okay. Let's start off with a slider question for a start. Um, what does an engineering lead do in a self-managing team? So, I can't shout, so can you guys hear me? 
<clears throat> Sorry. Um, it's not getting any better. <coughs> I used up everything I had today. So in a engineering, self-managing team, the engineering lead might be your scrum master, your scrum lead. So you'll have a product owner that oversees the product delivery for 12 to 18 months, very high level. They have that plan. The engineering lead will help lead the project team in the kind of three to six month period in what you're delivering day to day. Uh, this leads into kind of like your scrum master so that they're helping lead the team in what you're delivering. But one thing I did leave out because lack of voice, lack of time, mostly lack of voice, is all those engineers are getting to choose their own tasks. So that engineering lead is saying, right, these are our deliverable dates. This might be, um, we have you know, our high level milestones in this project. We have three milestones over X amount of time. And then the engineers get to choose those tasks. So the engineering leads keeps everyone in line, make sure the ceremonies are in place. So you have retros, um, you have all your sprint planning and everything else. So they're in charge of all the ceremonies and that kind of overseed process. Um, for the for the delivery for the the set time and the milestones. Alison or Shona, anything to add to that? No, it's not compulsory. It's absolutely fine. I wanted to ask a question of Alison actually. Um, you, you're talking about how cloud, basically, it's the application of financial management discipline. Financial management discipline, I would argue, is is a bog standard business practice. How did cloud manage to escape it in the first place? Because previously you wanted to create some infrastructure. The hoops, maybe some of you have organisations that are less hoopy. I've only ever worked in hoopy ones. The hoops to get that signed off, to cost it up, do the business case, get it signed off, get it purchased, get it installed, get it live. There were so many... Gateways, checks, call them what you will, red tape. Let's cut through it. Mm. Cloud is amazing because it allows engineers to engineer stuff really fast, especially if they're doing it in a DevOps way. And that causes spend. So you've removed all of the procurement hurdles, you've removed all of the potentially the project management approvals of you may buy this or what, or the budgetary approvals. You've put it right out to the edges with developers and engineers are causing spend on your organization. That's great, but with that ability to do that, you need stronger controls. So just turned it on its head. Okay. And Sean, the, the research or the, the um, academic who managed to run up accidentally a $25,000 bill, who paid it? They did. They did. Of course. Yep. Personally. Of course. Ouch. It comes out of their grant. So that's the yeah. unfortunate reality, especially in academia when you have grant funding. Um, you, you have to do your own project planning. And so for a young um, engineer, a PhD who has not entered into the corporate world yet, this can be a very sobering reality. Yeah, and potentially quite limiting in their work, I would imagine. Any questions from the floor? Gentleman there, James. Uh, hi, uh, James Kwan from IC Squared. Um, I had a question, sorry, April, I know you haven't got a voice, but uh, how do you, how, you, you talked about DevOps being a very human-centric thing, and you talked about people taking tasks in the vertical stack. What, what happens when you've got people who can't adapt to the, to the task? You know, you, like you said, you can't be a, everyone can't be an expert in everything, but how do you, how do you deal with those human factors where people can't take on the tasks that have been allocated. Yeah, <clears throat> we, got, we got to select our tasks because we own the, the tasks and it was a, the ability to say, yeah, I'll take on a new challenge. Um, it's adopting that growth mindset that came down from Satya. It said, you want to learn, you want to keep going. I got into tech because I continuously learn. If I didn't want to be learning every day of my job, I would have picked, picked a different industry. Um, so for me, that was a driver. But the reality is when we made that change in our engineering teams, we lost about 20% of our, of our people. It was tough. Any change in any organization, people don't want it. They feel threatened, they don't want the buy-in, or it's too hard, or we get too comfortable in what we're already doing. So we lost about 20% off the bat, but then we really embraced that culture and having good management teams to come in and say, look, you know, you might be into uh, a certain language, Do, try this thing. It's that encouragement to learn and giving people that safe space to learn, and that's what's really important. Um, my one manager said to me, code is play, go play. He would literally take the pressure 
off delivering a task and say, go learn this thing and go have fun. And I was like, oh, I did this thing today. It was really cool. I can't even be excited without croaking, sorry. Um, but I would come back and understand that I enjoyed something. And going back to the cost thing, there's cost to doing that. But we put guardrails in place, yeah. and we're humans. We make mistakes. We get too excited about something. We leave something on over a weekend, or we forget. I mean, I forget what I had for breakfast yesterday, much less turning off something I'm consuming. So we put guardrails in place to give people a safe space and a sandbox so we didn't have to sit them with a $50,000 bill, which I've seen, but put those guardrails and allow them a safe place and have that encouragement and part of their growth. And a lot of that growth was also part of our OKRs and deliverables. So what did I learn this week or in this sprint that was part of my deliverable for that sprint as well? Okay. Any other questions from the floor? Right at the very front here, please. Hi, uh, uh, sorry, Jack, if you could just wait for the microphone to arrive, please, sir. Okay. And then you can identify yourself as well. Please. Hello, uh, my name is Abhilash. Uh, I am a security engineer. So I have a question for April. So how do you ensure developers uh, write secure codes in the feature team that you talk about? So I showed the graph of bringing tools closer to the developer. So you're gonna see a lot of tools about that. So anytime you're consuming in the cloud, we want to enable our developers to be more secure. So uh, GitHub specifically, we have created tools to help that. So for instance, if you're working on a project, you clone your code to your machine you've now exposed that code. Um, I do a lot of work with NHS England, actually I shouldn't name the customer, a big health organization in England that runs our country, uh, but they bring in a lot of contractors. So a lot of you probably have contractors that come in, they clone that code. So I'm working with NHS to use GitHub code spaces. Um, I won't go into the technical details, I can talk to you all about later, because of time, but they spin up a code space, that code doesn't leave the repository. And in code spaces, we have other guardrails around that. So same way we have cost control guardrails, we have security guardrails. So by bringing those tools to the developer, it means as a engineer developer that security to me is it my love and passion for you, it is awesome, we need people like you, but it enables me to be a better developer because that is in there. So I use different code scanning tools, I use different practices, I do make sure all my code goes into pull requests, we do peer reviews, and we have tooling built into GitHub to do code scanning. So we're get, um, excuse me, our friends at uh, Uber put up a password, they don't have any security scanning tools. Those are critical. So we have tools where as an engineer, if I push up a password, Push protection stops me from even getting it to the repository, because once you get into the repository, that password is for life, not just for Christmas. Good point, good point. Right at the very back there, please. It's hard to make a joke when I'm broken. <laughs> Hello there, Dominic Colella from Metrics Group. We're a cloud benchmarker. Um, one of the biggest challenges that our clients have, whether it's a um, single cloud or a multi-cloud environment, um, is once a contract's in place with one of the cloud providers, how does FinOps help them ensure that cost optimization on usage is linked to that contract? Okay, I'll put that question to Alison. That's a great question because I would, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say just about every single contract will be signed before people really know how much they're going to be spending in the cloud. Just accept it. Try and have a bit of a plan. Try and make sure you've got the money to pay for that contract. Because, you know, organisations, I don't know all of your organisations, but a lot of them have a a five-year budgetary cycle, right? How on earth do we know what we're going to be doing in five years? So accept that there's this element of unknown, but generally your development costs go up, stay the same, or your investment costs stay the same, or they go up by 10% every, every year. You are going to have some fag packet numbers. Don't be scared of fag packet numbers, because in my um, 25 years' experience, the quick fag packet numbers followed up by two months of crunching them. Gosh, they were never that much different, but don't fully trust them, but that's just Alison's world. So to your question, you agree, it's like agreeing to spend an amount 
It's got to align to your corporate strategy. You've got to be able to pay for it. It's got to be right. And then the optimization comes when your spending is a little out of control and you've got to cut your cloth accordingly. Because it, unless organizations, and maybe smaller organizations, are able to map that all out and say, this is exactly what we're moving to cloud. We can size it. We can look at it. We can choose the most optimized solutions. And therefore, it's going to look like this. And this is what we're buying. If any of you are like that, I would love to speak to you after this. Because to me, that's like a dream world. Things that, and although at the same time, Cloud and everything it allows you that freedom to change, to pivot, to learn, to fail fast, to get a grazed knee and get up. So sign your contract, but don't expect to understand that that's made up of every last line. Big programs, you never have a detailed project plan when you're getting the business case for a big program. It's just the same logic. But don't overcommit. Sean, I'm, I'm missing something here. This is not my field of work, so I'm rocking backwards and forwards. Um, why is it not possible to stand this on its head and say, right, okay, we're, we're going to, you know, we're going to take a sum of money, say, you know, a million pounds, something like that. We're going to build the best widget we can for the million quid. Why can't you do it that way around? Yes. Why does it have to be sort of a, a whole series of unknowns? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question, um, and it. It's really impossible to forecast what training. It's again the R and D phase is when it's the most complicated for you. Um, and I think that just kind of building off of what you just said, Allison, I, I think that the real way to address for FinOps and and understanding what your spend will be is to just to demand market change. Your the the models are often so complex that the best ML ops engineer will not have the right capacity to understand the true hours it will take to do training and retraining. Having a million dollars in the bank really means nothing. Um, it could be three million, it could be half a million. Um, but I think the reality is the black box nature of the cloud providers, the data egress fees, and the force tools, I don't think people realize how much they're paying to be in the sandbox. It's not just about compute costs. It's everything that comes forced from the public cloud providers. So when you are trying to do project planning and you're trying to do resource allocation planning, you can estimate as much as you want that it will take 100 hours. But in reality, that could scale up or down by you know 10x. You, you obviously like the idea of fixed flat fees yes. from cloud providers. Why, why would any cloud provider do that? I mean, are you, are you just kind of waiting there optimistically hoping that one of them will break from the pack and say, tell you what, we'll do it? I think it is unrealistic to think the big three will change um, to flat fee. I think that virtual machines and um, the sheer nature of their business model being volume-based will never drive change. However, there are so many amazing new companies emerging on the market that do provide an alternative um, in so many different ways, um, both from a hardware technology and architecture perspective down to billing practices. Thoughts on that, April? So <clears throat> there's a question. Get right close I'm, up to the mic. I'm trying. <laughs> Let it work. Just, I'm going to do interpretive dance in a minute. There's a question about GitHub Copilot impacting development teams, and I want to talk about GitHub Copilot. For those of you that don't know what GitHub Copilot is, it's your AI pair programmer. So that is a flat fee. We democratize that for consumers, for developers. Why? Um, what we, so when, when GitHub Copilot came out, it was free because it was in uh, private preview effectively. It's now generally available and you can buy it. And I, I don't remember the cost. It's like $14 a month. And people complained about the cost, but it's a fixed fee. The reason why we did that is because we have GPU enabled machines behind that, powering that AI learning model to give you the best code we can. So it's a fixed fee on that subscription of Copilot. Um, so we have done it with certain products for the developer. We do it with our software fixed fee, but it is still consumption. We buy things by seats, but Copilot, um, that I'm just gonna say it's $14 a month, that is negotiable with your account team, and, and if you're a student, it's free or something. But um, 
that you can use as much of that model as you want. So if you're using it once in a while, like once a month, you spent $14, not a lot of value. If you're using it every single day, that drives value. So it's coming and it's getting better. It's still a new thing. Um, so how does that impact development teams? I use it every single day. Um, I'm writing code, I'm doing a thing. I'm by myself in my office. I can find a colleague if they're online or have colleagues in another country. It helps me write better code. It takes my old code and helps me revise it. It helps me write testing into my code. I, you know, we talk about 100% code coverage. We talk about security. Copilot can go in and help me build out those tools, and that's why it's really valuable. So it's helping us be better developers. It's not replacing me. It is pairing up with me to help me write that better code, and sometimes it gives me a starter for 10 as well. But we've tried to democratize that with a fixed fee, so it's coming. Um, but more people that consume it, the cheaper it gets. Mm. I'm going to take a question from Slido, and I'll put this to Alison for a start from Costa. Do you think that AI models and tools within cloud platforms will contribute to forecasting process? That's a really good question. So part of my work with Foundation when we were doing the um, forecasting working group, um, I was asked to review, they were, they were doing the next release of the FinOps book. It's now very fat, before it was quite thin. And I was asked to review the forecasting chapter. And in FinOps they have this crawl, walk, run. There's lots of different names for it, but evolve, basically. So they talk about at the run level of maturity, you cannot be at a run level of maturity in forecasting without machine learning and AI. And I'm like, oh. So in answer to your question, I'm not sure, but I think absolutely. My, fit, my concern with it is that what I have seen to date is blunt. It's really blunt. It's not clever enough. And it becomes that level, and maybe this shows my age and apologies if it does, and you know, trying to get with new things, but how does it know what we're doing? AI and the learning has to learn from something. If you're, if you're far enough into your journey, damn right, it's excellent. Don't you let it do the heavy lifting for you. If you're quite early in your journey and a lot of your organization is starting, or already, maybe already spending a lot in cloud, but you've still got a long way to go, I talk about steady state a lot when I'm speaking to people doing forecasting. If you're anywhere approaching steady state, yeah, it's magic. The past does help you predict the future. It helps you predict your, the times, whether, it, whether it's something to do with the weather or the market or your sales, whatever, it will work out that magic. But if you're early in the cycle, it's not great. So hopefully that answers your question, but come find me. I, again, I'm not from your world, um, and, and therefore I, I, I hear what you're saying about how the experience works. I occasionally fiddle around with cars. Yeah. You know, now I fiddle around with cars all my days, you know, and I know theoretically how long that job should take. Yeah. And all it takes is one rusted bolt, and all that experience <laughs> and all that sort of forecasting just goes straight out the yeah. window. It's, you know, because that, that can take an entire, you know, it, it's, three, four, ten times longer than you actually think to actually do these things. Are you, are you ever going to get to a stage, Shona, do you think, where you will be able to forecast this with what I would describe as reasonable accuracy, what the usage might be? So, yes, um, to some extent. But again, I think it will be attributed to how the current state of architecture will allow you. So I, what I mean by that is there's some really great companies out there that are not licensed through an API to integrate with the big three. So there is thing, there are things available on the market through, again, startups, third parties, companies outside of, of the current cloud providers that have excellent telemetry tracking, that have excellent resources, they are extremely accurate. I know us at MIT, we have something we've developed in-house that we utilize to track. Um, but again, it's because we use on-prem and we use bare metal, we're able to bring our own tools. So by default, we are a step ahead in terms of our tracking, simply because we are not forced to use particular tools um, that are you know, narrowly available in the market. So yeah, I mean, it is possible, but the state of things has to change. 
This is an interesting question. I'm, I'm just browsing through Slido as we're speaking at the same time from Miguel, um, and I'm putting this to April. How are the members of the team managed at a personal level? I mean, day to day, he says the team working and collaboration evolved, but who, who was actually looking after the individual? So the, <clears throat> every team has an engineering lead and a manager that's present. So they come after each other. Um, because we're geolocated, we have a stand up every single day. And our stand ups are 15 minutes. And we can get through a stand up in 15 minutes with 20 people. What did you do yesterday? What are you working on? And are you, are you blocked? If anything takes over those three questions in a, in a short snapshot, we go into a parking lot. Hey, um, Allison, I want to catch up with you later about the cost we spent yesterday. Let's catch up after. That is that 15 minutes to just have awareness of your team and pair up with your folks. Um, a lot of times also I think we find people we love working with. So if I'm taking on that task that I have no idea about, maybe it's security or maybe it's data, I will pair up with my buddy and say, hey, let's work on this together. So the manager oversees the team, the engineering lead makes sure everyone's okay. And those daily stand-ups and those practices were critical to making sure everyone's happy. And I think the reality is, we're not always happy. Things happen. You know, there's bad things in the world. The weather changes. It's hot out. I don't want to work today. My computer's melting. Or I just don't feel like getting out of bed. You know, so that's the, those, those stand-ups really brought that out. And our manager would take it offline. It's about taking those things offline. But having that awareness every day, just to touch with everyone and just say, hey, how you doing? And what are you working on? One more question from the floor, if anybody has one. Lady right at the front here. Second row, end. There you go. Again, if you wouldn't mind identifying yourself, please. Hi, I'm Priya from WNS. So this question is for Alison. Um, how do you make good predictions for collaborative or shared environments? It's really hard. So um, before I left my last organization, we were doing one of our, my biggest internal customers was um, data. It scares the bejesus out of me how big, big data is, you know. But good for going to the cloud, right, because it was creaking at the seams on-prem. And they would say, right, well, so, you know, at the early stages, they were fine. We're going we're gonna to ingest this much data. We're going to run these many queries, you know, all good. But once they open, the whole purpose of having that data there is to allow other areas of the bank. So if it's all, you know, the that's bank, mortgages or loans or, you know, we can... Well, I don't know what Johnny and mortgages is going to do. If he's allowed to run a query, I don't know what that cost is. So you get to... So I talked about our uplift to cover shared costs, and those are sort of the fundamental costs, but then you get into the realm of having a shared service. And my view is every shared service should have a shared service owner. And that shared service owner has got to do some of this thinking because it's not just for the FinOps, but the FinOps team should be absolutely hand in glove with them to work out what their widget is. Is it, if it were queries, would it, would it be the amount that this, this user of the shared service is storing? Could you measure it that way? Is it amount of the data throughput? What is... Only that shared service owner knows the service that they are then kind of selling on to somebody else, whether it's internal or external. What is the value of it? What are they delivering? Make it real. Make it less about bytes or storage or, you know, all of those things. Actually, what value is being delivered? Why is somebody going to be con coming and consuming this and therefore causing a cost? But it is difficult, and I would say and have said... Have those conversations with somebody centrally who's thinking about it from a FinOps point of view. You then get your cost data, you then get your usage, um, telemetry, whatever it is, your, your slicing tool to say. But where we had onboarding data so I could map everything, almost the shared service owner also needs to provide some mapping. How will they provide it? But don't go after every last pound. It might be that you can say, I can allocate 50% of it. The other 50% becomes almost a shared cost of the shared service. Do an uplift on the 50% you can allocate. There's various ways. It just takes a little bit of stepping back from it to look at the picture. And it's, initially, it's not a technical challenge. It's uh, understanding how it works, how people consume it, how you're selling it out there, what data you might have to slice it, and then using those levers to work out what the best way is. 
and sometimes it makes more sense to pick up shared costs centrally. Any thoughts on that, Sean? Um, yeah, I mean, somewhat. Um, sorry, I got distracted by the disingenuous question. <laughs> <laughs> um, can I answer that question? Yeah, you answer that question if you want. Um, and I'd love to chat with whoever wrote this. Um, if you, this is just based on experience. Um, even the Ivies don't have the luxury of paying up front um, for a black box deal. They don't know how much it's gonna cost them in egress, which is, I'm not joking you, tens of thousands of dollars. If you have petabytes worth of data, good luck to you. Um, and so in order to pay an upfront cost on compute that you have no clue what your consumption is going to be, I've yet to run into anyone, even Carnegie Mellon, UCLA, I've never heard of anyone paying up front for an unknown fee when you don't know what you're buying or getting. Thank you for answering that question. Thank you. Can I ask you folks, yes. I mean, that's, that's been really interesting on in all sorts of levels. Can I ask you just to ask, uh, to thank our first three speakers one more time, please? Thank you.